The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Tonight we're going to talk about count it all joy. If you'll open your Bibles to Hebrews 10 with me, I'm going to go back to the passage that I stalled in for a while. And I just feel in my soul that this idea for us as a church is so important. And, and then the exercise we had with little Ian, it kind of confirmed that I should make sure that we really have an understanding how in the midst of great loss, now listen to me, in the, in the midst of great loss, now a lot of us, we've gone through some pretty good losses in our life. I mean, you know, Sometimes, sometimes you go through them really young, and sometimes you go through them at different stages of your life, but it's, you don't get through it without some losses, do you, in your life? Everybody has to face them, and, um, and how you face them is what's important. And so we're talking about the, the book of Hebrews and the book of James are kind of like sister partners when it comes to suffering and, and for undeserved suffering. And it's a concept you really should know that there are, there are different ways of suffering. The three major ones that we talk about here that are common within man, and he talks about what is common to man. Well, let me, let me show you this. In verse 32, 33, 34, he says, Remember the former days when after being enlightened, the former days it was these people were Jewish old covenant believers, lost, lost in a very steeped daily religion, still lost. They came to Christ through the gospel, and now they're no longer former days. They're in the now days. Remember the former days when after being enlightened, they got saved? Then they got indoctrinally enlightened, enlightened about suffering for Christ. And, you know, Philippians 129, it's been granted. Listen, it's been granted. That's a strong word. It's been granted not only to believe in Jesus, but to suffer for his namesake. I mean, you just got to understand that. Well, he, here he, he goes on and says, you endured a great conflict of suffering, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourself a better possession and an everlasting or abiding one. And I want to focus on this idea that he says, in the midst of losing everything, talking about details of life, those earthly possessions that you can't die and take with you, right? Earthly possessions. And, and, and they're good things. They're, in fact, they're good things that God has given you. But the principle is you na naked you came into this world like Job the first chapter, and naked you will leave it as far as earthly possessions. So how are you going to deal with it in life is the issue. And so he says, he, 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 he says, you accepted it joyfully. You accepted it. I say, I like the word accepted. Listen, for some people, depends on their spiritual growth. Acceptance is boom. There it is. They get the news. They go right into their frame of reference through the word of God. Boom. They're there. They're right there. They accept it. They, they understand. They have knowledge of the word of God that this is a better day for them. It's a tougher day for me, but this day, this day too will get better. And it always does in the Lord. Uh, so the other people, they accept it, and it takes a longer period of time to do that. Um, but at some point, the key is accepting it joyfully. And, and that's a key, and we're going to talk about that. Out of James says, count it all. And he's talking about the same thing in James 1, 2 through 4, count it all joy. When you fall into the various trials and testings in your life, and he tells you the same thing. And he uses the word count it all joy. 
we'll talk about that tonight. I want to, I want to, I talk so much about accept it joyfully, I thought I would change the idea and count it all joy and go to another idea on this subject matter. But let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our, our study. I'll give you a moment of silence. You know that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. The dynamics of that part of learning and living is the word of God, categorically taught. It gives you a good scope of what the directive will of God is for your life. And the key for us is that it's the will of God in my heart. The will of God that I've learned that's in my heart, that's part of my life, that's part of the way I think about life. That's Ephesians 6.6. 6. <coughs> but you can't do it. You can't learn the Bible, nor can you apply it. In carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess it. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you and to restore you. That's the idea. To the ministry of the Holy Spirit who teaches you truth. That truth sets you free from the cosmic system of lies about yourself, to yourself, through yourself, to others. So God has a wonderful plan. And you can lose everything and not lose your joy. In fact, the secret, God says, is that if you lose everything, you still have the joy of God, and that's the most important possession you have on earth. The greatest possession on earth is the joy that God gives you of your relationship with him. Because in the end, that's all you have. In the end, you naked, you come in, naked, you go out, with the exception of your relationship with God. So, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and by internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God, for we have confessed our sins. We're back into the ministry fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and he will teach us. It's a given if we are open and receptive to the hearing and believing, then it begins to move in the cycle of faith in our life. And what he's promised is now into the performance of becoming reality. The promise in reality is where we live in the dynamics of our daily living. And it's what affects other people in a strategic ministry way. For we fade our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are, count it all joy. You know, sometimes... Sometimes you may go through some real suffering and never come out of it. You may not have the ending of Job where he restores everything, restores your health, restores your children, restores your wealth, does everything like that. But I tell you, the one thing that Job had to find and one thing we must all find to make this journey joyful is the plan of God, understanding why did God put it on me? We know if it's undeserved. Listen, when we suffer, we, we tell you three things. We tell you three things from the word of God. Be sure your suffering is not self-induced misery. Be sure it's not divine discipline because you have to approach them differently. You have to know how you approach them or undeserved suffering. And what we're talking about is undeserved suffering. We're talking about, and listen, undeserved suffering is from the new birth in Christ all the way till you die or Christ returns. You do understand it because you live in the devil's world, man. This is the angelic conflict. Undeserved suffering is all about the angelic conflict. Listen to me. It's the book of Job. If you doubt it, read. Now, it's a long book. Read the book. Don't read the first chapter and the last. <laughs> read the whole book, you know. Don't be a lazy student. Read the whole book and you'll see an interesting journey of a guy. In the end of the story, you know, it's a Hallmark uh, program. I don't know that he got kissed in the end. I guess he did. He had some more kids. Something happened. So something went on there. But so I guess it was a true Hallmark story. But the ending was phenomenal. Listen, every ending is phenomenal. But you may not get back what you've lost. And it doesn't matter because... The Bible here tells us, listen, listen to what he says here in this verse 34. He says, 
you can accept joyfully the seizure of your property knowing that's Bible doctrine, knowing that's, that's a very important word we'll talk about, knowing that you have, watch this, knowing, knowing you knowing that you have for yourselves, that's the one who lost, a better possession. You have better possessions and everlasting ones or abiding ones. I mean, these, these are eternal. The other are temporal. Nothing wrong with them, but they're just temporal. Right? They're just temporal. And, you know, and we all know that in some sense of a word. When, you, you know, hurricane comes through, I said this before, you watch people's reaction. On one hand, if they have insurance, then everything is, well, everything is placeable. Thank God that we didn't lose any of our people. Everything's replaceable. And so they have a little joy in this side. That's not what I'm talking about because they have a backup plan. They had insurance. They have this. They have that. That's a backup plan. Well, I want to see joy when you don't have a backup plan. <laughs> On the other hand, the things they lost that could never be replaced, pictures, memories, books, things like that, they're really sad about it. They stay sad for a long time about it because that's a loss. The other that's not a loss because I can replace it. This is a loss because it can't be replaced. And so you'll find people, they're very joyful about what the replacement idea, but the loss that can't be replaced, they're in a, they're in a funky place. And you can say, right, when you watch them on the news, I watch for that. I, and probably nobody else has, but I watch for that stuff. Because that's... That's what I'm interested in. Now, what, what the Bible's talking about is being joyful on both sides. Yes, be joyful there. You had a wonderful backup plan. That's wonderful. That was a God thing. But listen, so is the other. One is not better than the other as far as joyfulness. Accept it joyfully. And that's the point. And so James says, count it all joy. And so that's where we are today. And we're in the first century A.D. when they were really being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. And many of them, in our passage, 32 through 39, many of them were going back. They couldn't take it anymore. So they gave up and went back to the old system so they wouldn't be persecuted. That's who was persecuting them was the old system. So they, they thought, wrongly, of course, they thought that if they would leave and go back, they wouldn't be persecuted anymore. But that's not true. That is never true. That's a lie from the pit of hell. They'll never, they'll never be consent because you betrayed. I mean, and, and listen, how can you not be with Christ? I mean, you, your mindset, these people, listen, these are people who not just got saved, but they were enlightened. Remember that word? They were enlightened. They, they were experiencing Ephesians 1. The eyes of the soul have been enlightened through the word of God. There's nothing you can do with that. That's an eternal possession. And uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, they step back into a, a, a religious system that doesn't know any, throughout Christ, when you throw out Christ, you throw out the whole, you th listen, when you throw out Christ, you throw out the Godhead. What are you going back to? Well, they're just trying to get away from persecution. I do understand that. I mean, I understand why they're doing it, but it's unacceptable. That's tough, isn't it? It's tough. And that's called suffering for Christ. So, in this passage, the word knowing, see that word knowing I put on your paper? Look at your paper for a moment. See the word knowing? Ganasco. Now, ganasco is a really interesting word. There are, there are several words for knowing in the Bible. And, and it's a study all of its own. But Ganasco is a good one because it refers to a complete understanding of something. For example, I know what the Bible says about undeserved suffering. I know what the Bible says about eternal life. I know what the Bible says about marriage. I know what the Bible says about... See, that's, that, the way you know what it says about it is categorically. You have to look at it correctly. Here are eight different ideas about marriage. Here are eight different ideas about... So it gives you a big doctrine. Is, categorical doctrine is supposed to give you a bigger picture about what you're studying about or what your life questions would be about for answers. What does the Bible say? 
So that's why we teach that way here, because we understand Ganasco. Now, when you read that, I want you to look, look up there at, at Hebrews 10.34 and watch this. Because he tells you two things that's important to know. These people need to know two things. Ganasco. See, it says, accept it joyfully. The seizure property, accept it joyfully. And they're, they're accepting joyfully the seizure, the seizure of their property or their possessions is based on knowing two things that are listed. Watch this. Two things. See the word that? That sets up the, the, the two things. See, they're no, they get, in order for you to accept the loss of all earthly possessions, you've got to, have, you've got to know something about loss under undeserved suffering, the category. And here are two things you need to hold on to. Here are two things that's going to help you know so that you can accept joyfully the losses. Here's what it says. It says that you have for yourself a better possession. You haven't lost what's eternal. You've only lost what's temporal. Okay. Know for yourself a better possession and a lasting one. See the two things? That's what they know about undeserved suffering. That all, listen, here's what they know. They know Romans 8, 28. I mean, God is good all the time. He's, he's good all the time. Not just sometimes when it moves our way. He's good all the time when it moves his way. And when we understand that, then we're in a good place in our life to accept these things. These are, this is really important for you. And when you read the scriptures, look for things. When he says something like knowing, you don't have to guess what that means. All you got to do is just read it. You got to pay attention to what he's saying. He says, knowing that. It would be like saying this, knowing this, that, see, there are two things. And knowing those two things and believing and applying to your life can, can be the foundation of you accepting something joyfully. Okay? Look. Look. Take help. All of a sudden, you're a healthy person. This will really get you. When you're a health nut, take every kind of vitamin, do my exercises, a fit of, right? And you come up with Chihuahua Ganga. And Chihuahua Ganga just destroys your health. And the doctors don't know what it is. It's Wanga Ganga. They don't know. We've never, I've, I've been in the medical world all my life. I've never heard of such a thing. And we call it that because we don't know what it is and we don't have any treatment for it. And, well, what, what are we, how are we going to treat it? I don't know. We'll research it. It may take us 100 years, but we'll get a cure. See, that's optimism. But listen, if, it, if Wanga Ganga comes from God, there is no cure except for God. Well, undeserved suffering is such a thing. And it sometimes it detects your health, right? And listen, his hand on you, it's all for your good. Oh, you got it. <laughs> Well, I'll exchange. I, here, here's, how, here's how I get it as a pastor. Well, Ron, why don't we just exchange places? Why don't we just pray that you take my Wanga Ganga and I'll take your. And I want. No, I don't think that's the way it works. And it doesn't. Listen, I've heard. Listen, I've, heard, I've said at the bedside of parents who prayed that prayer for their kids. I'll take that any day. Give it to me, Father. Give it to me. But, you know, everybody's got their... Listen, it's your own. You, it's what you lose is a better position for you, a better possession, an everlasting one. You're not going to go through anything here that in the next life you'll go, whoa, I had no idea. I was just trying to get through it. I had no idea that had this kind of eternal weight and reward. I know it's hard to, hard to think that way right now, but it's one of the two things in it that we need to know. Um, 
what if you've what here I hear this from people what do I have left when I, what do I have left when I've lost everything that's a fair question I'm not poohooing the question but there's an answer for it and it, every Christian should have a good answer for that hmm? well, yeah God but listen how about Matthew the sixth chapter 25 through 34 did I put that on your paper huh oh, you so spo I spoil you people unbelievable <laughs> Yeah, I know. Listen, you know where that comes from? That's the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, that's the Sermon on the Mount, this famous Sermon on the Mount. And you know what the theme of it is? Oh, you know this. Listen, don't worry about anything today. Don't worry, be happy. Remember that? Yeah, remember that? Remember they used to have T-shirts. Like, I had one. I love that. Don't worry, be happy. We need to get those old T-shirts back out, don't we? Listen, don't worry. Here, don't worry. Be happy about about the details of life, whether you have them or don't have them. Don't worry about them. <clears throat> well, you say, Ron, that's easy for you to say. I know. It's easy for me to say because it's in the Bible. I didn't make this up. So when you read it, yeah, that's a wonderful. Hey, don't worry. Be happy, is part of that theme. And, and when you get to the very last verse, that's verse 34 of this section that he's talking about, don't worry, be happy, about details of life. Don't worry about what you wear. Don't worry about where you eat. Don't worry about where you're going to do this. Don't worry about this. And, he, and, he, and, he, and listen, he's not talking you, you be a bum. He's not saying don't work, be a bum. He's not talking about that. He's talking about, he's talking about the very thing we're talking about today. When you don't have it, what do you do? When, when you don't have it, what do you do? And so here, listen to what his, what, listen to what the last verse says. This is really good. I, I wish I could have written it. But then I'd have been God. So that wouldn't have worked out. Listen. So he says, at the end, here's, how, here's his concluding word. He says, so don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. Listen to what he says then. Here's his last line. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know that word trouble? It's That word trouble is K-A-K-I-A. -K and it means the trouble that the devil stirs up in your life. It is the things that are wicked that happen to you or malicious Vindictive, it's all about the angelic conflict. He's a, you see, K-A-K-I-A -K -K is, the I and the end is the quality of what's happening, the extent of it, the identity of the character of it. And the guy who's pushing it is the devil. That's his system. And so it's the angelic conflict. Every day, you are engaged in the angelic conflict, whether you want to be or not. So you might as well learn how to engage in the angelic conflict so you can win. Because he's going to knock on your door every day because you're alive. And God is going to let him knock on your door every day so that you can be a good soldier. You can be a warrior. That's why he tells you in Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God. Where? Once in a while, <laughs> I recommend it every day, he says. I recommend it every day because every day you're going to be in a battle. Now, we know that, don't we? Life itself teaches you that. I mean, listen, every guy who lives on commissions would like to live on the best day he ever had on commissions the rest of his life. Okay, God, I'd like to see that every day of my life. If you could give me that every day of my life, I'd be happy. Of course, you wouldn't. And your boss wouldn't because he'd want higher production. If you can do that, how come you can't produce more, right? No, the joy is in who does it, and you know it. The joy is in who does it, and you know it. 
So there's a great passage on this. The doctrinal answer is spiritual growth capacity for the believer. He said, what do, you, what do you have left when, when you lose everything? The answer is spiritual growth capacity of a believer of the word of God in their soul. That's the secret. That's why you're here. People that know this, they don't miss Bible study. People who don't know this, that don't care to know it, they miss Bible study because they don't understand how important. Listen, faith comes by what? Where's that say that in the Bible? Romans 10, 17. See, it's one thing quote, it's another place. Listen, if you're going to quote the word of God, the devil, if you don't know where it is and can stand on that before him, because that's the sword you have, it's not, well, I think it says somewhere in the Bible, oh, he's got you. When he confronted Christ, Christ pulled it out and he said, Deuteronomy, it's such and such a verse, and he had him. You got to learn. The principles, once, it, once the principle gets you in soul, which is the very hardest thing, once you get the principle in there, then learn where it is found because other people want to know it and other people, oh, maybe your friends would listen to what you say, but so, if they're not, they want to know where'd you get that. I was that guy. If you'd have said that to me, I'd say, okay, where's that found? Because I'm going to go home and look it up. Then I'll be back. Listen. The doctrinal answer, you must have the spiritual capacity of spirit, the spiritual capacity of the word of God in your soul to be able to accept joyfully the loss of everything. I mean, how are you going to do that? You got to have the spiritual capacity. Now, in James 1, look on your paper, in James 1, verses 2 through 4, he says, count it. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm using the King James because I like that. My, my Bible says consider, and that's okay. That's a fair translation. I like the word count. Hagelmai is, is an interesting word because the, what it means when you use the word count or account, it means to give an account for something. Give an account for something. That's what it means. It means to give an, Hagelmai means to give an account. It could be translated count or it could be translated consider but the idea, now notice also, it's an aorist middle imperative. That's a command, second person plural. In other words, he's speaking to all of us in the word count. The aorist, now watch this. See the word, look, consider it all, it all joy, my brethren, when. Circle the word when and draw a line up there to the aorist tense. See that A, that's aorist. Aorist middle imperative. The aorist tense is a point in time when. The aorist is a point in time when. Are you with me with that? So when do I count it all joy? When do I give an account that I accept that joyfully to the Father? When do I give an account to the Father that I accept it joyfully? Now, listen to me. Are you with me? It's in the when. The heiress point is in the when. That not, I'm not saying W-I-N-D. I'm saying W-H-E-N. When. Now, watch. When you encounter various trials... Testings, knowing, notice that's the same word, ganasco. Did you notice that? I put them there so you would see the identical word. See, I had it up there in Hebrews 10, 34. Do you see that on your paper? I'm back to that word. In James, James talking about the same thing. Knowing, he puts it a present active participle. The present tense is, the word of God categorically in your soul that is able to face any trial, right? Here's one trial. What do I do? I got to know. It don't matter what the trial is. It's undeserved. It don't matter what the trial is. Job had physical. Then he had financial. You know what I mean? He, he had death in the family. Then he had financial loss. Then he had physical loss and friendship loss and all the things that go with it. That's various testings. Are you with me? Various testings. 
right? But you missed this. You missed it. Now come back to it. Count it what? What's the all? The various testings. Right? That's what he told you it was. Count it all, Joe. I don't care what the testing is. You got the category. You, you've got the doctrine. You got the doctrine. You got the categorical doctrine of undeserved suffering of how, how to deal with it. Right? So you got to know. What am I knowing? I'm, I'm understanding the doctrine of undeserved suffering. Count it all joy. When? That's the error stance. And that's a command. The counting is a command. Give an account to God that you understand that, that he's put, what he's put on your plate, I can accept it joyfully. And if you don't know anything else about it, you got two things now, right? That you have a better possession. Whatever he took you, there's better for you. And an and a, and a everlasting one. Just for example. But you see the word... Now, here, here's knowing. Now, I doubt if this is on your paper. I don't give you everything at one time, I hope. And if Colossians 3, 2 is on there, I've really spoiled you. Is Colossians 3, 2 there? All right, it ought to be. All right, it ought to be. You know what it says? Listen to me. Look up here. L listen to me. That's the only way I know if you're listening, because if you're right and you're not listening to me, you're listening to yourself. You want to make sure you spell right? I know I've been there. I've set where you are. All right, so I have to call your attention because I know you're floating somewhere. I, how do you spell that? That was me when I sat in class. I, get, I could get, well, anyhow, here it is. Set your mind on things above, not on things below. Right? See, that's, that's what our passage says. I can accept it joyfully because I know I have better. I have better possessions than what I had because God don't take, God is good. He's not going to take from me and not, not do better. He promised you, did he not promise you the word better? Yes. Is that not in his promise? Yes. Better. And listen, if you, would, if you would write a journal once in a while and then write in it and look back, you would see that God has done that every time in your life. He took an old car that wouldn't work and he gave you one that would. He took something here, he let, you, he let you wrestle with it a while, then he removed it and turned around and gave you something better. Think how many times he did that in your life. You would think that we would learn the principle that he had going for us, but we don't. We stumble and falter and huff and puff. And, and that, that's all right if you're growing. If you're growing and not groaning. If you're growing and not groaning, that's a good thing. And at some point, you've got to be able to do that. All right, so he says knowing, and it's ganasco, knowing what two things? Knowing what? See, always pay attention to that. Listen, ganasco, listen, it's an open book test. What do you find knowing? It's an open book test. You don't have, listen, you just, he gives you the answers. See? Knowing, and of course, you have to be in Bible study. <laughs> knowing that, there's a, there it is, that the testing of your faith produces. That's, that's a word, work, production. It's a production. Wor what, working. Your faith, when it works, it produces something better than what it started with, right? It's producing. Always moving you in a positive way. Faith always moving you positive in the plan of God. Always. Always. That's why all things work together for good. So here's testing, right? Count it all joy when you fall into various types of testing, knowing two things. That first, the testing of your faith is what it's about. The testing of your faith is working to produce positive stuff in you that's character building. Character building. Knowing knowing that your faith produces endurance. And endurance, when it works, see, we're in a system, it works, it has a perfect work, it bring, it's bringing things into conclusion in the will of God, it's bringing the will of God so that you can see that the will of God, the, the Romans 12, 2, that the, word of, the will of God is, is wonderful, acceptable, and fulfilling, Right? 
that let endurance keep its keep its work going on so that so that you can be teleos so that you can be teleos that you can be uh, you can find the the reason of it working in your life and what it's producing teleos maturity and and working to bring you into a, com a more complete understanding of God's will in your life and how it works. So that, watch this now, so that you're lacking in what? Oh, no. You think it's something. So that you're lacking in what? Then say something. So don't get that, don't get that screwy idea in your head. So you're lacking in what? Because you see, when God puts you in various testings and you know it's undeserved, you can fit the category, then God is moving you. It, it, the whole thing is to get faith, the faith cycle working where, where you grab a promise and know he will fulfill it, he, he, that he is able to perform, and you begin to let that work in your life and endurance. And other passages, the writer's going to tell you, endurance produces this, and that produces that, and that produces that, and that produces that, until God gets to some place where you see that the will of God, the directive will of God working in your life is a good thing. It's acceptable. It's perfect. It's complete. And when, it, when you have come to that place in your life, there's a spiritual growth maturity moment in your life in relationship with God and trust, and he moves you into another realm. That's so good. I am giving you such good stuff tonight. I am giving you such good stuff. Because this stuff's going to roll over your life. There is no way. There is no way you're going to go. If you're a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the next thing on your plate is to suffer for Christ. There's no way you're going to get past this. You got to know how to embrace it, enjoy it. Does he not tell you, accept it what? Joyfully. <laughs> and if you let it work, it's work. The bottom line, don't you like the bottom line? I'm a bottom line guy. I like the bottom line. Lacking what? And, that's, and, listen, and you know what? That's okay with you. See? If you've gone to the end of the line of God working this out in your life, how faithful God is. God is faithful. <laughs> then, you know, when you get through and you sit back there and you're drinking a good, good old iced tea and in you back in your chair and mellowing out and going like, well, that wasn't so bad. And the father says, I know. <laughs> Got second round coming. I'm giving you a break. <laughs> and it's only going to get better. When you go through the next one, you're going to love what I'm going to do for you. You're going to love it. So you, you may not hear them say this with, with verbal words, but you'll see it in their eyes. Bring it on. I can't wait to see the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So there always is one. What's the, what's the bottom line? Lacking. Nothing. Lacking. Nothing. That ain't at the front unless you got the word of God. Point number one. <laughs> Point number one. <laughs> Jeez, point number one. One day I'm going to learn how to do this. Every spiritual advance of Let me skip point number one. <laughs> Let me just skip it. I, I, got, I can only do one. Bar. I only got two points. I, 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 but you covered them on one anyway. You covered them on one. I know. We'll just make up another one. Let me do this and we'll get out of here. This is what I this is what I want you to see. I know. 
You got to have the spiritual growth capacity of faith. Faith. It's about faith, right? We, he, he, James tells us about faith. Faith produces endurance. Endurance produces yet yet. So you got to have the spiritual growth. Where does faith come from? Hearing the word of God, then it has to be cycled. You've got to learn how to cycle the word of God through your, through your life by faith. That's the key. That's the key. But now here's the secret. Testing is going to fall under three categories of spiritual growth. And I really want you to get this. I really want you will never find any. This, this will be the church. You will never find this taught anywhere. Never. Unless they've, unless they've come through us. And I can't understand why. They, well, I understand why the devil would fight this thing. Listen, the, the three stages of spiritual growth. And the testing is going to be in regard to that. Because of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he's not going to do more than he promised, right? So it's all based on spiritual capacity, based on faith. Take it in, you know, inhale, exhale of faith. Now listen, newborn babes, watch, there's two Greek words that are really important. And I gave you scripture on them. Newborn babes is the word brethos. Brethos is 1 Peter 2, 2. A newborn babe desires a sincere milk of the word. That's mother's breast milk. That's what that's about. That's bre bre see, bre breast milk, breathos, breast milk, okay? And that's newborn babies. N that's a unique milk, and that's, that's the milk of the gospel and salvation, what that means. That, that person, I just got saved. What do I, you know, I just got, I just got born again, and so the, somebody tells you, Okay, here's why you're saved. Here's got it. And it, make sure that you have it. That's just, everything's about your birth. Okay? That's the milk of that, of the brethos. The newborn then goes to a stage that still requires milk, which is all about salvation in respect to salvation. But it's not about how, when I got saved, how I got saved, and the gospel. It is now about what did salvation bring my life? And that the milk doctrines of salvation, we, we call it the 50 things. And, and, and this is where you nail down eternal security and all those kind of things is in that. And this, this, this person in the Greek language is known as napios. See napios, N-E-P, that, by the way, that E is long. You put a line over it. That's a long. And this is found in Hebrews uh, 5.13. And he tells you something really important. Would you put your eyes on that for just a moment? We're in the book of Hebrews, I guess, yet. Just drop back to 5. Look at 13. Put your eyes on this. Everyone, and now we're talking about a napios. We're not talking about a newborn. We're talking about an infant. This would be a person that we would probably identify uh, up through school age until they get under a tutor. Everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness for, because he's a na napios. Okay. He's not, he, you can't put him on meat. But he's, still, he's still on, he's, he's, and, and in our society, we would, we would take him until he, in their, in their society, until they put him under a tutor. So this would, we would call this an infant up to, pre, up to the preschool period. Uh, if we, we were doing, uh, and Acts, the 20th chapter, verse 32, uh, that's well worth your read. And 1 Corinthians 13, 11, in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, they tell you that uh, uh, when you're mature, you shouldn't be childish, right? Childish. The word childish in there is a napios. A napios. That's a normal behavior of a, of a napios but shouldn't be a, a normal behavior of an adult. And he uses the word anair. That's a mature man. Uh, Paul must have been getting after somebody. Uh, so that's, that, those verses in there, and so there, there's a milk, that's a, that's a newborn, and through, uh, through uh, early stages of growth of a child. The immature child is, what is called a, a technion, a techn technion or a technon, a technion, is a, a child who's now uh, uh, under tutoring, is being trained and educated, and, uh, and that was true in their society. It's true in ours. And, and that's a natural state. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's an immature state. 
Um, that's elementary, junior high, that type of thing. Um, education and training stage. And this is where you introduce them to meat doctrines. Um, the, the, this is, uh, you, you know, there's base, this is a doctrines that deal with the Christian way of life. This, like faith rest cycle, the filling ministry, the spirituality, carnality, and all those type of things. W one of the passages you should read, I don't have time tonight, but you should read 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 7, and pay attention to the word, my son. When he speaks to Timothy, he speaks to Timothy, my son, and he calls him a technon. He calls him a technon, which is really interesting because that's a unique word for the word son. And, uh, and he says, I want you to be strong in the grace of, of Christ Jesus. I want you to be strong. And he, so what he's doing, he's teaching and training. He's still tra tra teaching and training him. And, and Timothy is still in that position. He's out working, but he's still, he still needs a tutor to help him. And, and Paul is that guy there, and he reminds him of that. And, and Paul is thankful that Timothy knows that. Um, the immature believer is taught to walk the walk, not just to talk. He's taught, he's taught to walk the walk. For example, in John 13, 33 to 35, Jesus tells his disciple, I give you a new commandment, love one another. Now, here's the walk the walk. Love one another just as I have loved you. Love one another. That's, that's, that's walk the walk, not the talk. Say, walk the walk. And you know why it is? Because others will know that you are my disciples. You got to walk the walk. And listen, other people didn't trust him when they couldn't walk the walk. They, they would go out on something. They would do it. They, for, for example, one time they tried to, they brought to the disciples, a guy brought the disciples, one, a demon-possessed child of his that was being thrown in the fire and doing all kinds of things. And they tried to cast the demon out. They couldn't get him out. So the, the father went, get out of the way. I'm going to take him to somebody who can do this. Uh, so they bring him to Jesus. And it's a wonderful story in there. Yeah. What? I didn't write it down, Mike. Sorry, I didn't write it down. But it, it's, it's in the Gospels. And, and so they, they couldn't do it. And so he, he does it. And, and, it, and it was really crazy. It's a, it's a wonderful story about demon possession. And, I mean, he didn't come out easy. And he threw this kid all over the place and did convulsions and all kinds of stuff. And it finally came out. And when, when the demon finally came out, they thought the child was dead because it was such a human struggle within the, pers the person's life for the demon to come out because he had, he had taken such strong possession. And then J Jesus reached down and picked him up, and he, he was back to normal. It's a wonderful story. I wish I'd have wrote it down, Mike. I didn't. I just wrote the idea down. Now, when I go home, I'll have to find that for you, Michael, because I won't be able to sleep tonight because I did that. Now, I know. I know. Uh, just look for demon activity in your concordance, and you'll find this story. Uh, it's in Mark. Oh, in Mark. Okay, in Mark. Well, that's that helps. That's a book. <laughs> We're close. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. We're in a, it's in the shortest book. That's pretty good. Listen, don't don't go there right now. Don't go there right now with me. Stay with me. I, it was just a story, that, but it's in the Bible. Stay with me. Ephesians five eight. Because I only got I only got a short time here. Formerly, wa formerly we walked in darkness. Formerly we walked in darkness. Now he says, now we walk in Christ Jesus as children of light. See, it's about the walk is my point. W w where the, <coughs> the, the baby, you're not. <coughs> now it's all about teaching them to walk the walk. Not teaching them necessarily how to walk. That's in the first part of this. The last part of it is walking the walk. When they can walk the walk, when they are consistent, and walking by the Spirit, and walking by faith. That's what walk by the walk is, right? When they can do that, then they're going to have enough maturity to move to my third stage, which is teleos. That's the mature stage. That's a meat eater. That's a steady diet on meat, a steady diet. This is the educator training now. 
this is the person, this is the parent, so to speak. This is now the educator and the trainer. This is Paul working with Timothy. Timothy is a mature person. And Timothy, you know what Timothy's doing out on the field? Teaching and training other people. Okay? That's how the system works. This is Hebrews 5, 11 through 13, verse 13, in, uh, 11 through 14. 5, 13, it talks about an apios and then moves to a teleos in verse 14. By the way, the teleos is also mentioned in the sixth chapter, verse 1. And what is the goal of the Christian? What is the goal of a spiritually mature believer? Here it is, Galatians 4, 19. Here's the goal. Here's the goal. Not just that people would know you're my disciples. It's a bigger goal than that. It's a bigger goal than that. The goal is for Christ, watch this now, until we all attain, that means to arrive at something, like uh, Mr. Russell, he left Durham on a train until he arrived to Birmingham, and then he transported, he transferred over to a bus and then to another depot until he walked over here to where his destiny was, and now he's got to be transferred again to his sister's house. And for him, he arrived in Birmingham, and then the rest of it is normal. This is now the trip in Birmingham. What is your arrival? I mean, everybody wants to know, when it, what's your arrival time, right? Well, he had, he had two or three of them, but the arrival time that everybody wanted to know is when, when, you, when you hit Birmingham. Because he's going to have several of them before he leaves Birmingham and arrival time back to Durham. And so this is what this is about here when he says, until we all arrive, until we all attain, watch this now. Watch this now. And when I get through, you tell me how many four things. Until we all attain, four things. Four things. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge, epinosis, of the Son of God. That's full knowledge of what we're talking about. To a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. See those four things? You want to know what it means to have Christ formed in you, right? You want to know what it means to have Christ formed in you? That's what it means to have Christ formed in you. Come to the unity of faith. You know what that means? Listen, here's the unity of faith. It means that one doctrine lines up with another doctrine, lines up with another doctrine, because how do I know that? Because faith comes by what? Hearing the word of God. And listen, if you're properly taught, that word of God that's being taught to you is categorically, is teaching you how to move uh, one block to another block in your life successfully from one episode to another episode to another episode successfully. And if you, if you, you keep your head in the word of God, stay in a church that teaches categorical doctrine, we'll absolutely do that. But you got to come to church to get it. You, you got to sit in the dynamics of a class. Eyeball to eyeball. That's how you get it. That's how you get it. That's how I know you get it. I see eyeball to eyeball with you. I see, I see how you get it. I'm a teacher. We don't want somebody's getting them when they're not. You know, I can't control whether you get it or not. I can, I can only control that it's given to you. To, I can give it for you to know. So the unity of the faith, that's one idea. Knowledge. I mean the full knowledge of the Son of God. Not, listen, listen to me, listen to me, listen, look up here. Not who he is has he come to the world. Mm -mm. Who he is, the fullness of his knowledge to who he is in us. You can have this knowledge over here and never be saved. You got to have be saved to have this knowledge here. Do you understand the difference? Jesus says to his disciples, who do people say I am? Oh, they said, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that, you're that. Yeah, there was common, common opinion. Then he, he looked them right in the eye and said, well, who do, you, who do you say I Who do you say I am? Because it's about where it is personally. It's not where it's popular. 
It's where it's personal, not popular, personal. This is what the writer is talking about here. When he says coming to the full knowledge, the full knowledge, this is not who Jesus Christ, well, he's a, you know, he's part of the Godhead. He, he, he's a great teacher. He came and he, listen. No, no. I mean, who, he, who is he to you? Who is he in the fullness of the knowledge to you? Who is Jesus to you? Listen to me. He's got to be more than a savior. You've been too long in the word of God. If all you can tell me he's my savior, that's newborn baby talk. Dada, mama. Dada, mama. Dada, mama. I want that kind of language here. Epinosis, full-grown, mature understanding of the dynamics of Jesus Christ, the personal relation I have with Jesus Christ. He's not just my Savior, and he's not just my figure, figuratively speaking, my Lord. Who is he in my personal life? He says to his disciples, who do you say I am? Who, who am I to you? Peter says, you're the, you're the son of God. You're the messianic savior of the world. And that all, he didn't say this. Here's what, here, 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 here's what it is. Is that all I am to you? I mean, that's, that's plenty right now, Peter. If I, if I, then he comes out with this great statement, what, about the church? Be built on that foundation. Upon that foundation, I will build my church. But listen, he had a lot more to teach Peter, did he not? Peter's got to go through all these trials. Peter knows it's in his heart. You go through all these trials. For Jesus to said with him after the resurrection, and say to him, Peter, do you love me? Then ask him, who do you think I am? He said to Peter, do you love me? The answer was, then show me that you know me and love me. Take care of my sheep. And who is Christ? Who is Jesus Christ to us in epinosis? Who is he personally? What do I know about him that's important in my life every day? See, I think that's important. At least it was to the writer because he, he put it as number two out of four. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Count it all joy. Let's look. One, one, Was that? Mark. Okay, Mark 1, Michael. Oh, Mark 9. Where he threw them all over the place and. Okay. There's one in chapter okay. 1 where he had some too. Well, this yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, chapter 9. Thank you, guys. I knew, I knew you'd get after it. It's a great story, by the way. And the wonderful thing, it was a true story. I think it's close. In one of the places, I think it was right after the feeding. Oh, it could be. I honestly, I, I don't. Honestly, I don't know. Was that is that where it happened? All right. Well, I tell you, I'll never do that again. <laughs> if I ain't got it on the paper, I ain't gonna bring it up. But listen, you were wonderful to find it. That's what, and listen, how good is a study Bible? We just where we, you right? Yeah, you just go there and start looking for it, and they, then you read to see if Ron knew what he, I don't know. I just picked, I picked up the story. 
Well, let's have a word of prayer and get them off, then we'll have our prayer. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way by automobile and by the Internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God. And for those who are interested in that little story, it's out of Mark 9 as far as we know. And so that would be a good, good point for you to look at if that's of interest to you. Um, encourage our hearts, Father, to count it all joy and all of our losses because it only means gain. Better. The writer said better. I like that word. I like that word. So we're thankful for it. We'll hold that close to our heart, Father, tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.